I receive a lot of impatience in this talk, so let's give it a go. Uh, quickly about myself, my name is Tuana, and I lead the developer relations team at Beepsets. Um, and I primarily work on, like we already mentioned, Haystack, which is a fully open source framework, and I'll show you a bit about Haystack as well. But the idea behind retrieval augmentation, just to give everyone some context as to the Python scripts I'm going to be showing later on in the talk, unfortunately, there is no world where AI sees the entire world and is this all-knowing entity that can answer any question. This does not exist. So when we talk about retrieval augmented generation, RAG, RAG, everyone sort of refers to it in a different way, the idea is that large language models or language models in general, they don't know everything, but they are actually quite, uh, some of them, uh, they are quite good at following at least some sort of instruction. So retrieval augmented generation is actually, I heard um, Jerry Liu from Lama Index call it a hack. I think it's also a hack. It's a trick, basically, to make us take advantage of the fact that large language models can follow instructions quite well. And by doing that, we're allowing it to give responses to questions about data it might not know about. That could be our personal data, it could be company data, anything that wasn't there while this language model is, was being trained. So I actually have an example of that. I'm pretty sure everyone has seen this UI, everyone's used ChatGPT in some way. If you can't read it, that's okay. I'm just gonna read it out to you. I basically asked, what are the different rankers in Haystack? And that's all I've asked. And I've gotten this reply. And it's a pretty comprehensive reply. And it's actually listing out some names of rankers as well. But unfortunately, this answer is totally wrong. Um, apart from one of those rankers, we do not have these rankers. Um, so what's the problem here? And the problem is that the language model I'm using here, ChatGPT, or GPT-3 in this case, well, it didn't know about Haystack and the rankers that we have w during the time it was trained. So we actually have a documentation page on these rankers, and there we list Cohere ranker, Diversity ranker, Lost in the Middle ranker, etc. And none of these were in the reply that ChatGPT gave me. So how can I navigate this? Well, this, this is basically what you're seeing here is what retrieval augmented generation is trying to achieve. I've changed my query, and the query is not just a question. The query is an instruction, and the instruction says, given the documentation, answer the following query. And then here, basically, I've cheated. I've copy-pasted the beginnings of that documentation page you saw, and then I followed it up by the query, what are the different rankers in Haystack? Now, turns out that this, this, um, this methodology here, this getting that right context there, um, maybe even pre-processing it, maybe getting it into the right format, that isn't as simple as it seems. So retrieval augmentation is basically, okay, how do I find the right context given the query, and how do I give that context to the large language model in a way that it can actually make use of? And before I get into how we do that in Haystack and what Haystack is, I just want to preface this. I've often been hearing the term retrieval augmentation referred to in the context of question answering, but actually it completely depends on what the instruction even is. So you'll hear about retrieval augmentation in the context of answering questions based on your documentation or an API, etc. But if you change your instruction or prompt, this is where the whole world of prompt engineering comes into play, to say summarize the following documents, then you got a summarization application. You could even have a retrieval augmented generative pipeline application that generates questions and not just answers. And the nice thing about this is that you can connect a lot of different data sources for this retrieval augmentation step. It could be your database, like Weaviate, OpenSearch, Elastic. It could be the web. It could be a completely separate API. It could be Discord, Slack, anything like that. At the end of the presentation, I'm actually going to show you a retrieval augmented pipeline I built uh, using Hacker News. So I just wanted to have a pipeline that would give me a summary of the latest Hacker News posts that day, each of them one by one. That is also a retrieval augmented generation pipeline. So about Haystack. Haystack is our fully open source large language model framework, all written in Python. That QR code should take you to our GitHub repository. 
And the core ideas of Haystack is based on the concept of nodes and pipelines. So the core project uh, provides developers with a set of nodes that they can use. And there are two main types of pipelines that we have. One of them is called the indexing pipeline. This is where you prepare data, prepare text, either in PDF files, markdown files. You might even skip this step. I'll show you later where we have maybe an API for this step rather than our prepared documents. And then you write them into a document store. That's what an indexing pipeline does. This could be Milvis, Sweeviate, anything like that. And then the other type of pipeline, again, you create this yourself based on the application you actually want to build. Um, and what you're seeing here, I hope you can actually see it, but it's a retriever node followed by what we call a prompt node. But you can think of that as a generative component. And this is what we call a query pipeline. And the idea is each of these nodes, you can mix and match. You could even have a summarizer node if you want to. Um, and the model you use, that's completely up to the engineers that are building with Haystack. So for my retrieval step, I might want to use a model from Hugging Face, which is basically an open source library of models. But for my generative one, I could say, oh, I want to use OpenAI and use a performant model like GPT-4. Like I said, you can also completely ditch the indexing pipeline step. You can still build quite effective RAG pipelines. I'm going to call it RAG for now, and it's just easier than saying retrieval augmentation every time. Um, by just simply connecting a query pipeline to an API, your Slack, your Discord, the web. Literally, you can just connect it to Google, and then you can build a RAG pipeline. So here is an example of a RAG pipeline, and it's not actually doing question answering. This used to be Twitter, and then Elon took over Twitter, and the API closed down, so I changed it to Mastodon. But the idea with this was, so this is not question answering at all. My prompt is actually asking, give me a summary, like give me a kind of like a vibe check for this user. What do they post about? What's their tone? What languages do they use? And so on. And the idea is the query is supposed to be the username. And this actually um, is my boyfriend's username. And I like it because it says he has a bit of a salty tone. Somewhere it says critical and somewhat sarcastic. Um, so you can enter a Mastodon username and kind of get like a vibe check of what they post about. I called it Should I Follow, which is where we kind of put in a username and judge you and see if we should follow you. Um, and that QR code should take you to a working example on Hugging Face Spaces. So how do we build these types of things? Well, in Haystack, like I said, Haystack is built on the idea of pipelines. There are two uh, main nodes, I would say, that make a RAG pipeline what it actually is. Um, and here I'm not even talking about the retriever step. I'm talking about the instruction we're sending to the large language model, um, and then what, how we interact with that large, large language, which large language model e is it even. And those two things are the prompt template. And this is kind of like um, you designing your blueprint of how you want to interact with an LLM. And the cool thing about this is it can change at query time because the, prompt, the, the, the blueprint basically can be filled in at each query depending on what the query is. And the second most important node component is called the prompt node. This one is very simple. This is basically your interface with a large language model. You can decide, am I using an Azure uh, uh, model deployed on Azure, a SageMaker model, OpenAI, whatnot. And this is the node that is basically sending out the full instruction, the query, and it's the one receiving the answer from whatever language model you've decided to use. So what does that look like? Um, I'm going to describe this because I think it might be a bit too small for you guys to see at the back. But this is what we have as a prompt template. This is an example prompt template for question answering. And I've said, given the context, please answer the question. If the answer is not contained within the context, please say I don't know what the answer is. Um, but the most important things to notice here are the two things that I try to highlight in blue. One of them says join documents, and the other says query. And when I mentioned how this template can basically change at query time, this is what I mean. So the template now knows that at each query, I'm expecting something called documents to be handed over to me and something called query to be handed over to me. And we'll see how that happens when we build the pipeline. 
And then how do I use this template? Well, that's where the prompt node comes in. Um, here, for example, you can see that I've picked GPT 3.5 Turbo. Obviously, in this case, I need an OpenAI API key. And then I've basically instructed my prompt node to say, every time you in interact with GPT, the default prompt template you should use is the one we just defined there. The other option you get in, uh, in Haystack is instead, if you don't want to bother with building out your own prompt template, you can use one of the ones we've provided. It comes through a platform we call the Prompt Hub, and you, that QR code should take you to the Prompt Hub. And here, for example, I've picked Deep Set Question Answering. So it's our default question answering prompt. All right, so now we've got these two elements defined. How do we even, how do we actually build out a pipeline that's runnable, that's actually getting the right documents based on the query I've asked? So that's what we're going to build. We're going to build a pipeline that has access to a set of documents. Then we're going to have a component called a retriever. Quickly about the retriever, all that you really need to know is that a retriever is a component that does either embedding or semantic search or keyword search. And what it's good at is, given a query, it kind of acts as a filter between you and your database that might have thousands of documents. So given the query, it says, OK, here are the top five most relevant documents in your database about this query. Those are the only things you should care about. And that number is, you can set that number, whether it's 5, 10, 15, whatever. So this is what we're going to build. And then the retriever is going to actually forward those documents we saw and put it into our prompt template. All right, so here I've got an example. I've got a Weaviate document store. And let's imagine, I've actually built this, but let's imagine for now that my Weaviate document store has all of my Haystack documentation documents. So that ranker, that ranker documentation that you saw is in there. And then I've got my retriever. Here I'm deciding to use an open source retriever. It's a retriever from Sentence Transformers. So this is being pulled from Hugging Face. And then for my prompt node, I'm using the same template you saw before, the one that we built. But this time, I decided to go with GPT-4. Uh, that's just the choice we can make. Uh, so now we've got all of the components that are needed for a RAG pipeline. What I do is I define a pipeline. And then there's only three lines here. First, we've defined a pipeline. Next, we've said add node, and the first node we're adding is the retriever node. And you can see that the inputs query in Haystack, right now at least, is sort of like a special status. So we know that the first thing, the, the query, should be first um, sent off to the retriever. And then we're adding a second node, and the retriever always returns something called documents. And we're saying whatever retriever is returning, hand that over the, to the prompt node that has that join document that we, we saw before. And then I can simply run it. And the nice thing about this is that every query, so you can change the query that's being inputted to my full instruction to a large language model. But the main thing here is you can see that I've got params, parameters, retriever. That top K I can change based on how long each, my, each of my documents are. Some large language models do not allow for as much context window as others, so this is where I can start playing around with um, how much context I'm giving to a document store, uh, to a large language model. All right, so different types of retrieval. Now, I've shown you how the pipeline is built, but depending on the application you want to build, um, and wh whether that application is question answering or summarizing, or in some cases you want to have question answering, but it's more like give me an answer about this broad topic, a comprehensive answer about this broad topic. So the answer n might not be one thing. Depending on that, actually, it turns out that the quality of the document, the context you're giving to a large language model matters a lot when it comes to how well you want the answer to be. If the documents or your context you're providing makes no sense for the query that's being asked, then there's nothing we should expect from the large language model. They are designed to do one thing really well, but at the end of the day, if, they don't, if they're not given the context, they're not going to be able to answer questions. So again, this is another demo we have. Um, and I kind of find it funny that I'm talking about this in San Francisco, but the idea here is uh, 
retrieval augmented generative pipeline that's supposed to be answering questions about SVB, uh, the SVB collapse, etc. And this application is actually giving you two answers. One answer is based uh, on just pure GPT, no retrieval augmentation involved. And the second answer is when retrieval augmentation is involved. And actually, there are two types of retrieval happening here, and you can pick which one you're using. One is just web search, so that's where we're getting the context from. The other is your static data set. So I've got a data set full of news articles from around that time. Another way we can do retrieval, so we can have the web, um, and we can have semantic search, the other way we can do retrieval is simply keyword search. And again, this depends on your data and what kind of queries you're expecting your users to input. For example, if, my document if I'm expecting people to do documentation search and just write the name of the node, like prompt node, and it's not a fully formed question, maybe actually keyword search makes a lot more sense to retrieve the right context. And in some cases, you know, still semantic search is very, very powerful. In some cases, that works. But semantic search has been great, for example, when you have, let's say, um, you're like a retail store and you have lots of identification on like um, stuff you're selling, like ABC X12. In that case, semantic search is probably not going to do really well on its own. Maybe you need a combination of keyword and semantic, maybe even metadata filtering. So another option we have here is using pipeline branching. So when a query, uh, when a user has a query, you do both semantic and keyword search, and then you join them in some way. There are different ways of joining this, and these components are again available in Haystack. If you do want to build this type of retrieval, again, depends on your data and what you expect your users to be inputting. What about ranking? So I'm going to be talking about a few ranking techniques we have. Two of them are quite new. Um, but often we also have uh, extra ranking step. I'll tell you a bit about why. Let's say we have our data set somewhere or an API somewhere, and we've used a retriever to retrieve the most relevant uh, context, depending on either keyword or semantic similarity or something like that. Well, in some cases, we follow that up by a ranker before we send out the full instruction to a large language model. Um, so I've got an example of that, and this is diversity ranking. And this is important for questions where, like I mentioned, let's say you say, um, give me an answer or explain to me this broad topic. Give me a comprehensive answer on this broad topic. Um, so I kind of like, like talking about this with this example um, where I've got these this similarity search that's returned to me a bunch of documents and I've color coded them. So you can see in order the blue ones or the blue hues are very similar to each other and then less similar and then less similar. Now what happens if my large language model context window allows me to only use this amount of it? As you can see it's mostly just the blues that are very similar to each other and some greens. So what happens if I, wa if I want a question like, give me, um, what are the impacts of climate change? Give me a comprehensive answer. Ideally, I want that answer to involve impacts on society, the environment, politics, and so on. If I'm covering only very, very similar topics, then that's probably not going to be a comprehensive answer. And the large language model shouldn't be blamed because it, we've told it to only base its answer on our context. So we use diversity ranking, where we can basically shuffle this up. We still start with the most similar document, but then we do what's the least similar within the pool of similar documents, and then we shuffle it up. This is one style of ranking. Um, again, this is a code example of us using that ranker with actually web retrieval. So here the retriever is basically Google search, um, and then we're retrieving a bunch of documents, but then we're saying do diversity ranking on this, so that the context I'm providing to an LLM has a bit of a mixture of topics that are being covered. Another one is lost in the middle. This is very new, and this is based on a very recent research paper that showed that the answers given by a large language model predominantly appeared at the beginning or the end of the context window. 
And this is kind of interesting, um, and it, it presents a problem, because in many cases, context that in the, co with like in the middle of the context window could be a lot more relevant to the query than the ones at the end. Again, this uh, in lost in the middle re-ranker is a reshuffle of the documents we've already received from the retriever. Um, and again, that QR code should take you to a Colab notebook where both the diversity ranker and the lost in the middle ranker are being used in a full RAG pipeline. Another option we have is Kahir. Kahir does a lot on embedding models and re-ranking models. Um, so this is actually from the documentation page. And you can follow up either a Kahir embedding model um, retriever or an open source one from uh, Hugging Face with a re-ranker from Kahir. And this is where they basically go through all of the documents we have. And they, s they also have the query at hand. And they re-rank it yet again based on the most relevant documents um, that you might uh, want to provide to the large language model. The last one is probably very unique to specific use cases. Uh, and this is about recentness. So in some cases, you don't, it's not necessarily about the relevance of the document. It's about when that document appeared. So maybe I just want to say, summarize the latest email, uh, emails I'm getting. Maybe that's not a great example, but that should give you an idea. Uh, and recentness ranking is, oops, oh, I don't have that slide. Recent this ranking is simply saying, this is the date field of every document. Please rank them to the, for the most recent to the, to the one that appears latest. Um, and then we make sure that the, especially if you say get the last one, you're making sure that you can maybe set up a system that's running daily and you're getting the most recent summary from your latest emails, etc. All right, I want to quickly wrap this up with a uh, quick introduction to Haystack 2.0 because everything I've been showing so far is uh, Haystack V1. Um, and we are doing a major update to Haystack, um, which is going to hopefully come along by the end of this year. Um, but it actually impacts how you build RAG pipelines quite a bit. The main reason for that is we're changing the way we approach nodes or components quite a bit. And we're making it a lot more easy for you to build your own components. So if you have a very unique use case for a RAG pipeline, so my example is going to be Hacker News summaries, then you can use Haystack 2.0 components to build your own pretty quickly. Um, I've got an example here, and this is a valid Haystack 2.0 pipeline. The only things here that matter is the at component, the component decorator at the, at the top, Basically, I've said class my component, and my component is now a haystack component that could be just slotted into whatever section of the pipeline that I need. The other thing is the run function, um, and then that's returning a dictionary of something, which I can then use in a follow-up component or in the pipeline somehow. Um, and then you can see the dot output types. This is used for um, evaluating pipelines, checking that the pipeline is in the structure that we want it to be, basically. So this is what I built the other day. Um, I basically wanted a Hacker News Fetcher component um, that I could put into a RAG pipeline. And I wanted the RAG pipeline to run and then tell me what, what's the latest, like the latest three Hacker News articles, give me a summary for each. So the way I did that was I declared a Hacker News newest fetcher, <laughs> not the greatest name. Um, and I basically summarized the code snippets here. Uh, it's a bit of a pseudo code right now. But the run function is expecting a last k. So I can say the last five articles, the last three articles. And then it's simply fetching those articles um, and then returning them in a dictionary in articles. So I know that something called articles is going to be um, returned by this new component. And now I can actually use that. Our prompt templates are also changing in Haystack 2.0. Before you saw the join documents in blue, now we're actually using Jinja templating, um, which means it's quite cool because we can now typhonically define what the, how the prompt is being built. And I can now, well, my component is returning articles, so I can actually now loop through articles and do whatever I want with it. 
In my case, I was quite lucky because my articles that I was returning, they had metadata where I had the URLs of every Hacker News article that I was getting. So I can actually build something where the content is being followed up by the URL. And if I'm using a really good LLM, I could actually potentially build a system that also references where the summary is coming from, which is quite neat. And that's it. So the way I built this was I have the Hacker News component, I follow that up by a prompt component, and then I'm sending all of that off to an open AI model. And you can see the full example in that QR code. I wrote about this as well, um, and hopefully the code still works. <laughs> there might have been some updates to Haystack 2.0, um, but uh, the collab there should be runnable uh, as well. All right, thank you very much. Um, here are two resources. One is about Haystack 2.0 that I was talking about. The other is about the few rankers we discussed, and that's it. And if you want to follow me, I post a lot of these on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you very much. We do have five minutes for Q&A. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. I think you're getting a mic. So I'm um, curious based on your experience, to what extent the ranking, like the order of the documents that we pass to the language model impacts the quality of the outcome? Because I think you use ranking more as a tool to identify good documents, or like diverse yeah. documents. But I'm talking about specifically the order. Um, the order, I think it kind of depends mostly on your, the application you want to use. So like you said, the diversity ranking has been the one that has had the most impact in my experience. It also depends on the large language model you're using though. So we've noticed that some large language models approach a con the context window slightly differently to others. Um, and that's actually why that paper came out, Lost in the Middle. So there they found the ordering does matter, but it's actually not in the intuitive way you think. They found that Intuitively, you would say the most similar documents, the most relevant documents to this query come at the top, and then it gets less similar and less, similar, less relevant. Well, but they found that actually a lot of large language models don't happen to work that way. We don't necessarily under understand exactly why, but we've noticed that there's the reason it's called lost in the middle is a lot of the relevant context in the middle of the context window just gets avoided. It's not taken into consideration at all. So that's why we use lost in the middle re-ranking. So there's definitely some impact. And then the impact also depends on what your application is. So again, I'm gonna go back to diversity ranking. But if I want my application to give a comprehensive answer on a broad topic, but if the context I'm providing is all similar to each other over and over and over again, and I've made sure that, RAG is also an application to reduce hallucination. So you're very, um, strict with the way you're prompting the model. Answer only based on this context. And if it's not doing that, actually, then there's a problem. You should probably do some tweaking there. And then if you're saying that, but then the context isn't providing any diversity, then there's not much you can expect from the LLM. So yeah. There's one over there, I think, yeah. So I've been using uh, Langchain a lot. Um, why might I switch from Langchain to Haystack, or when would I use Haystack? Um, Langchain is definitely how we consider ourselves competitors to Langchain, so I'm gonna be very upfront there. Um, it is a very, very powerful tool. I've used Langchain myself. It's very nice and easy to, to get started with. There are two main differences in Haystack, I would say. So Haystack has been around for five years. So Haystack wasn't built for LLMs, and a lot of those pipelines and components uh, I was showing actually cover a lot of what we now call traditional NLP, which turns out to be very useful for these types of RAG pipelines. Because before you get to a large language model, you might want to do a lot of more simple summarizing, embedding retrie retrieval, et cetera. So LLMs has been like a extra for us, an improvement for us. The other thing is in 2.0, the way I showed the components, actually this is where I say like our approach is very different to Langchain. In Langchain, um, the, most simple the most simple thing in Langchain is often a chain. And we want to be a lot more modular than that. So I think the level of 
um, custom building would differ if you, that's where you would choose Haystack or Langchain. A component is supposed to do one thing, just one thing, and do that one thing really well. A component is not supposed to give you the full result. Um, so the idea there is we don't know what you might want to build. We don't know what you might want to connect to an LLM. So we are providing a way for you to build that. Hope that makes sense. That's all the time we have, guys. Can you please take it offline? We will be around. Um, me and Silvano, who also works on Haystack, so find us. We have the Haystack bucket hats. So it will be easy to spot. Thank, Thank you. you.